Easter Sunday Gospel concluded with excitement. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Today, we are all set up to see the disciples in joyful movement, or at least arguing with her about her announcement. Instead, that very next sentence that begins our gospel for today states that it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. I have seen the Lord, Mary announced very early in the day. And in the evening, the doors are still locked out of fear. The disciples are probably quiet so as not to be overheard. It's as if Mary's announcement has had no effect. Or maybe they're also afraid of this man Mary called Jesus. He really can't be Jesus, can he? Have you ever noticed that when something hurts, you tend to protect it? I know that if I have a bad stomach ache, I will curl up and put the least possible pressure on it. When I broke my big toe, even when I wore my special shoe, I tended to walk on my heel and avoid rolling onto the ball of my foot. It just hurt too much. When we hurt our hands or our arms, we tend to hold them close to our body, protected and comforted. After Jesus' death, the disciples in John's Gospel act like that. Even though they may have been told by Mary earlier in the day, that Jesus has been raised from the dead, they are still hiding. The traumatic events of the last three days have affected them as they affected Mary, but they are behaving differently than she did. Their lives haven't changed. This kind of pain and fear can't be overcome by reason or caught by joy. Jesus' disciples, his closest friends, were nursing their painful souls a retracted state, as in fear, in grief, perhaps in guilt, and not really knowing what to make of Mary Magdalene's witness that she has seen Jesus. And then all of a sudden, Jesus stand, is standing among them. He is flesh and blood and bears the scars of his horrible death, which he shows to them. He says to them twice, peace be with you. And then... They are at peace within themselves and with each other. Jesus breathes on them and gives them the Holy Spirit. If we consider Pentecost in the book of Acts to be the gift of the Holy Spirit to the church, in the Gospel of John, Pentecost doesn't happen 50 days after Easter. It happens Easter evening. It's all very condensed. And here is something interesting. The Greek doesn't say that Jesus breathed on them. It says he breathed into them. As in Genesis 2, when humanity was created and the breath of life was breathed into the human creature. They become inspired. Their pain and fear had led them to believe and behave as, as if they were dead. Their spirits were dead. They needed the Holy Spirit to revive them, to give them a purpose. And what is their purpose? What will the Holy Spirit drive them to do? Forgive. Jesus says in one breath, receive the Holy Spirit. And in the next breath, he says, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Other people need our forgiveness in order to be forgiven. As former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, wrote, there's no hope of understanding the resurrection outside the process of renewing humanity in forgiveness. We're all agreed that the empty tomb proves nothing. We need to add that no amount of apparitions, however well authenticated, would mean anything either, apart from the testimony of forgiven lives communicating forgiveness. The resurrection was an experience of forgiveness. The 
disciples had all abandoned Jesus, becoming complicit with his murderers. The fact that the resurrection was happening to them was an experience of forgiveness for them. Jesus' crucifixion by itself is a tragedy. The one who is both God and human was killed in a particularly gruesome way as the people in power looked for any excuse to get rid of him and his friends deserted him. Jesus' resurrection was a personal event for Mary Magdalene. But when she tried to share that event with the other disciples, her words fell flat. They couldn't understand. The resurrection hadn't yet happened for them. They might have dared to hope that it was true. They might also have been afraid that it was true. In their fear, unbelief, and guilt, they didn't know how Jesus would be for them. Only Jesus' bodily appearance, sharing peace with them, and breathing the Holy Spirit into them with the commission to forgive would do that. Jesus forgave them their lack of understanding, their fearful hiding, their lack of trust and hope. The parallel text in Matthew's Gospel is called by Roman Catholics the Office of the Keys. And Jesus says, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Catholics believe that authority was given in a particular way to Peter and his successors and popes. The Episcopal Church's emphasis on the apostolic succession of bishops is another way to see it. But in a way, and particularly as we read it in the book of John, this forgiving and retaining, this binding and loosing, is part of the resurrection life and the task of all of us. Forgiveness is simply the way to be in Christ. Forgiveness brought the disciples, including Thomas, out of that locked room and made them apostles, the sent out ones, ready to begin speaking in truth and love. It made them able to stand up to questioning, like we heard in our first lesson, without blaming and causing a vengeful reaction. It's the basis of all Christian community and communion, especially our table fellowship. And as French theologian Christiane Ducoq says, it is an invitation to the imagination. Forgiveness is not forgetfulness of the past. Rather, it is the risk of a future other than the one imposed by the past or by memory. The disciples were haunted by the past. Their memories were unsettling in the extreme. The risk of any future at all was too great. So they were paralyzed and in hiding. Jesus took the pain away. He brought blessing to the possibilities of other futures. They were freed by forgiveness, inspired by the Holy Spirit. It's no wonder they began to move. Their limbs, formerly contracted in pain, became limber and loose again and they used those limbs to cover the known world as they told the good news. Forgiveness as an invitation to the imagination. If you imagine that your body, your heart, your spirit is hurting, if you remember that Jesus often forgave sins before he healed those who were sick and in pain, I invite you to imagine who or what needs forgiving in your life? Bullies and abusers are special cases, and you may require distance in order to extend full and free forgiveness. But I invite you to consider how risky your future might be if you forgave someone else, if you forgave yourself. There's little to be afraid of and much freedom to claim. You are forgiven. Receive the Holy Spirit. Now move.